Uh, our next speaker, we're going to continue the discussion with uh, Raffaella Loricola. Uh, Daniel Carrillo uh, will be speaking about ambrosia beetles and, uh, and the fungus. Daniel. All right. Uh, first, I would like to thank the organizing com uh, committee for this uh, wonderful opportunity. And I also want to acknowledge um, the co-authors of this uh, paper. There's three, three here in the audience, uh, Alina Campbell, that is uh, doing some molecular analysis to the fungal isolates. Uh, Dr. Randy Pletz, that is the head of the pathology laboratory in, in our station, so he's leading the um, pathology part, and Dr. Jorge Peña, that is the, lead of the, the, the head of the entomology lab uh, in, and, and the head of all the entomology part of this um, study. So I guess that by now everybody knows that we're dealing with this invasive species, um, this ambrosia beetles, Heliborus glabretus, that vectors some um, phytopathogenic fungus, Raphaelia loricola. And uh, when the beetle inoculates uh, the fungus in, in trees, uh, mostly trees uh, of the family Lauraceae, it causes the larry will disease. Mm, so the, this has um, served some motivation for us to start uh, studying uh, the ambrosia beetle communities that are associated with, um, with avocados. And I don't know if you are familiar with the avocado production in, in Florida, but uh, most of the or the commercial avocado production is concentrated in the southern part of the state. There are few avocados throughout the central and northern part of the state that grown isolately in, in backyards or in this kind of setting. So as the, 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 the beetle uh, moved uh, south and, and mostly uh, on swamp base, uh, reproducing on swamp base and red base and native uh, plants, it also affected these this avocados, and we tried to gather all the possible information uh, from that, uh, collecting samples and placing them in these emergence chambers and see which uh, beetles we recover from that. Uh, the detailed information about this is going to appear in a paper that, that is coming out in September in the Florida Entomologists, uh, Florida Entomolo uh, Entomologists so you could find some, some detailed information there if you are interested. But in few words, uh, we have identified 17 species. So you see the situation is completely different to what we observed yesterday. Have a great diversity of beetles associated with avocado there. And I'm not going to talk about all of them. Um, I'm going to mention what we have seen with uh, Wallacea fornicatus for obvious reasons because you're interested. But our main target is Siliborus glabratus. And I'm also going to talk about this, this other uh, species that are the most um, abundant found associated with, with avocados. So very briefly with um, Eulesia fornicatus, uh, there was a previous record back in 2002, um, a sample brought to the ornamental entomology lab uh, from our station on uh, a dead branch of Royal Poinciana. And the biologist there, uh, Holly Glenn, thought it was um, Silosrandus cruciusculus because they have similar, similar size. But she decided to send the samples uh, for ID, and that um, turned to be the first USA record for this, um, for this insect. So after that, there was uh, a lot of excitement. Uh, they placed a lot of traps in the, in the area. It was a residential area. Uh, in the Kendall area, and they found some, some specimens, um, but um, not too many, and things kind of cool, cool down. And now in this uh, project where we were collecting uh, wood from avocado, we found uh, a single specimen back in 2009 in a commercial avocado grove. And very recently, uh, like two months ago, we found uh, two groves that were infested with the with the beetle. Um, we were lucky that these two groves uh, are from one of uh, the growers that collaborates with us a lot. So uh, they helped us to, or they allowed us to put in several traps. So now we know that the beetle is widely distributed in those, in those two groves, but 
uh, a common pattern is that we are observing the bill associated with trees that are already wilted, that died uh, presumably because of other causes, but we, we are not observing what you guys um, are having here. Um, and um, well, that's pretty much the, the stage of it. Uh, we know where the populations are, and we're going to keep an eye on that. But back to, to our main um, interest, that is the, the red bay ambrosia beetle. I think Jorge already touched uh, into this. Basically, we found that uh, celebrated gladiators in very low populations, or we didn't recover it in most of the avocados that were affected by laurel wilt throughout central um, and, and north Florida. Finally, in 2011, we found a, a large infestation very close to the commercial, commercial uh, avocado region. Uh, it's less than 10 miles uh, to, to the northern part of the, of the avocado region. Uh, and uh, we were expecting something to happen. It stayed one year with a lot of expectations, and finally, early this year, we found the first, uh, the first avocado that was diagnosed, where the, the pathogen was recovered from it, but we did not find um, um, the, the beetle. And, and so far, we have 27 reports, uh, this is in the last uh, two months, and we have collected the beetle uh, wood samples from all those trees, and we still do not find the, the beetle, the, the primary vector. So we get this, we have this wood that is infected with the, with the pathogen, we have this great diversity of beetles, but we don't have the, the primary vector. And so we started to, to ask uh, what is the role of all these other beetles in, in there, and we had um, one reference, one report from Dr. Harrington where he he recovered the uh, Raphaelia lauricula from Celebrino sexisani. So we said, let's explore uh, those possibilities. And we selected uh, nine species of uh, Celebrini. Uh, of course, Celeborus glabratus, that is our, like our positive control. Celeborus affinis, Celeborus volvulus, Celeborus ferruginius. Celebrinus gracilis, Celebrinus sexisanis, Celosandus crassusculus, and Bridosomus uh, devexulus, and um, Leconte. And we basically um, waited to get some good cohorts of each species emerging from wood that is infected with, the, with Raffaella lauricula. And we take part of those beetles uh, to test for presence of the, of the pathogen to see if the pathogen could be isolated from those beetles, and um, another part to conduct controlled uh, infestations on healthy avocado and, and red bay plants. So the, the part of the recovery of the fungus from the beetles that was carried out by the pathology lab, but in, in very few words, we just provided the beetles, the beetles were Surface is sterilized and plated in a selective medium where we could recover the, the pathogen and count um, the, the number of uh, colony forming units. So we have an idea of the inoculum that is carried by each individual and, and then uh, confirm the identity of those isolates with uh, microsatellites and, and LSU analysis. And this table here summarizes the results of this first part. Here you have the, the number of beetles that were tested for each species, the number of beetles that were carrying the, and the pathogen, and the probability of a beetle carrying the, the pathogen. So to our surprise, seven, seven species out of the nine that we tested, at least one, one beetle was carrying the pathogen. And in, in this, we had a species where very few beetles were carrying the pathogen, like in Crassusculus or Sexesani or Affinis, but we had, for instance, the three, Celeborus bulbulus, Celeborus ferruginius, or Celeborinus gracilis, where more than half of the individuals were carrying the pathogen. And if we look at the number of colony forming units, it was uh, more than one order of magnitude higher in the, in the uh, glabratus 
compared with the others, but if you look at the, at the range, we found some individuals that were carrying um, high amounts of them, of them, of the pathogen. So the second part was to con uh, conduct control infestations with, with the separate um, beetles. Basically release a, a number of beetles in sleeves and allow the beetles to attack the plants and then observe uh, if uh, the pathogen, uh, if, if the disease will reproduce on those plants. Uh, when the plants did not show symptoms, uh, we let them uh, for three months, and when they showed symptoms, we observed the disease development, and um, when the plants have wilted completely, we will dissect the, the, the plants, and we basically removed the, the bark of the plants, and we looked for, for boring uh, attempts on the bark, and how many of those boring attempts passed the, the, the bark section and went into the xylem uh, of the of the plant where the, where the fungus grows. Uh, so we looked for internal symptoms, external symptoms, the length of the galleries to see if we could recover beetles or any stages from those uh, galleries. And of course, um, we tried to recover the pathogen uh, from wood of those, of those trees. And this uh, graph here shows uh, how were the, the boring attempts and the, the galleries? You can see that Sileborus glabratus, a similar uh, number of boring attempts and, and construction of galleries in, in both hosts did, did well in, in both of them. But all the other beetles, in general, they, they attack both avocado and red bay. But the number of galleries constructed was significantly higher uh, in red bay than, than in avocado. That has something to do with, uh, with what we were observing yesterday with the secretions that, that avo avocado has. So, uh, and this uh, graph here describes the, the recovery of the pathogen and the development of symptoms on those uh, plants. So all, all plants that were infested with Sileborus glabratus it, we recovered the pathogen from all of them, and they all showed symptoms. And in avocado, only we recovered the, the pathogen uh, from plants that were uh, infested with Sileborus bulbulus and ferrugineus. In, in Sileborus bulbulus, we recovered the pathogen from three plants, but only two were showing symptoms. And um, the same happened with ferrugineus. We recovered the pathogen, but the plants did not develop symptoms. So Apparently, there is a threshold or a minimum inoculum required to, to trigger the disease. I think that Dr. Pletz has uh, found uh, similar results in inoculating the, the plants with different concentrations of the pathogen. But in red bay, the, the situation was completely different. All of the beetles were able to, to transmit the, the, the pathogen and cause the the disease it was variable, but we had the same situation here in, in, with ferrugineus, in which plant, in one plant that uh, where the pathogen was recovered but did not develop symptoms. The same with sexy sani, and uh, uh, with crassusculus, we had the, the opposite um, condition. We had three plants that wilted, but we recovered the pathogen only from one, and we attribute this most uh, a physical damage. So remember here that uh, well, first Sileborus crassusculus is one of the biggest beetles, uh, constructed a long and, and, and many galleries, so we attribute that more uh, to physical damage. So to conclude, well, this biologic, the biological invasion by Sileborus glabratus and, and Rafaela lauricula has resulted in new beetle uh, fungus associations it's so a case of a lateral transfer of this pathogen among uh, several ambrosia beetles that are sharing a, an ecological niche. We know that at least uh, these six Celebrini species, other than the red bay ambrosia beetle, can carry and transmit the pathogen to healthy avocado and, and red bay trees and cause larval wilt disease. 
Of course, this was under control conditions. And our data suggests that this phenomenon is more likely to occur in Red Bay than, than in avocado. And this opens um, well, many questions. Um, now we need to explore what is the nature of these beetle fungus associations. Are the, the beetles going to benefit from this association? Is the fungus going to benefit from the, from the association? Uh, we need to answer those questions. Will these other ambrosia beetles attack healthy plants? There are, we have some, some beetles there, like Silosandrus crassusculus, that definitely attacks uh, healthy plants. There are some reports of um, Silivorus affinis, Silivorus ferruginus attacking uh, healthy plants. That's controversial. We have some experiments um, carrying out. Uh, would, would they be attracted to stress plants? We are working on an avocado <coughs> production, uh, a commercial setting, where plants are subject to a lot of stress. We demand from those plants to, to produce a lot of fruit. Um, also, what will be the effect of, of pruning? That is a common uh, practice in, in Florida. And, uh, also, where is Silivorus glabratus? Are we going to find it in the commercial groves or, or not? And uh, with that, I finish. I would like to acknowledge the Florida Avocado Committee, the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, and for providing funding for this um, for this research. Mike Thomas for the beetle like this, and everybody in Peñas and Pletz's lab uh, for working um, in this project. And thank you very much. You showed uh, quite a few images of uh, plants and containers. Uh, are you seeing it in plants and containers at nurseries in the Florida area? Uh, can you repeat that? You, you had a lot of images where you showed plants and containers, like from nurseries. Are you seeing it, the, the beetles? Oh, no. No. Not in the nurseries. Uh, and we have not seen the, the beetle in the avocado growing region at all. No? So, so far it's been uh, um, up to that large infestation near the avocado growing region, about 10 miles north, but we, cannot, we have not detected the, the beetle uh, in, in that area. And that limits a lot of our research because we cannot work with uh, big plants. All the research is limited to to this is small plant. Mm -hmm. yeah, I just wanted to, wanted to mention that uh, experimentally and uh, in the field, there's a profound correlation between plant size and whether or not this disease will develop and whether the beetle is attracted to trees. Bigger trees, more attacks, more disease. Small trees, not so much. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. You're welcome.